name of Allah who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad and in the name of his last and most surely his greatest messenger, the exalted Christ, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we thank the both of them for our divine guide in this hour, Brother Minister Louis Farrakhan. Brothers and sisters, we're very happy to have you here with us. We want to thank all of our guests and visitors from out of town. And we'd like to, just in a few minutes, we're going to not bring Minister Farrakhan right on, but we have some guests that we want you to hear from. But before we introduce those guests, I would like to say a few words because this is our second anniversary at the Final Call Administration Building. And I want to say a word about the two years that we've been working, and especially Minister Farrakhan working with this radio broadcast that has reached out to the city of Chicago. To those brothers and sisters in our radio audience in particular, the ones who are confined to a hospital, confined to your homes, those who are at work or those who are incarcerated that listen to this broadcast, our prayers go out to you. We thank you for your support for the last two years. In the last two years on this radio broadcast, as one newspaper report said, a few of them, that there was approximately a, a listening audience of 37 to 42,000 people. However, in the last eight months since Minister Farrakhan had been attacked in the media, the listening audience had been broadened. We want to thank those who attacked our minister. I know you're attacked. <laughs> I know that the attacks on Minister Farrakhan, some of it was just fear. Others, were, it was outright hatred of the message of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in his mouth. But all things work to the glory of God. And though you attacked him because of his support of Reverend Jackson and statements that you didn't understand or you misunderstood or you took out of context, you caused many black people in the Chicago community to tune in to this radio station. We want to thank radio station WBEE, and especially Mr. Sherrell and his staff for the last two years for their work in aiding us to get this message out to our people across the city of Chicago. And even under tremendous pressure and attacks on the station in terms of trying to get Minister Farrakhan off the station, WBEE has stood up. So we thank that staff. We'd like to also thank the brothers and sisters throughout the Chicago area who may not attend the meetings here at the Final Call Administration Building, and you are welcome to come here, but each and every week you send a donation, regardless of how small or how large, we thank you for those donations. We thank you also for the purchase of Minister Farrakhan's tapes. Each week the phone, when he finishes and says, Assalamu alaikum, the phones begin to ring. And then the FOI, our brothers, they go throughout the city of Chicago to deliver tapes from the lecture of that particular Sunday. The purchase of those tapes helped in our work of keeping this broadcast on the air. In the last two years, the Nation of Islam has spent over $50,000 reaching out to black people in the Chicago community. So we want to thank you for your support, and we want you to continue to support the work of Brother Minister Louis Farrakhan. Most of all, we want to thank Brother Minister Farrakhan for his work. Allah, through his messenger, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, has blessed him you know, in his unselfish effort to reach out to the black community and to, to deliver the message of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and to hold up the words and the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So we thank Brother Minister Farrakhan. And I want to take shortly, just very briefly, a page from history and show how God speeds things up. Minister Farrakhan was able to perform this same type of service years ago. And it's interesting that his history in the nation of Islam has always been rebuilding something from the time he went to Boston as a young Muslim, coming to New York after the death of Malcolm and building the city of New York, and then building, rebuilding not a city now, but the entire nation of Islam. And in his own history, he had a radio broadcast in New York, and it took him nearly three and a half, four years before that radio broadcast begin to actually rock the city of New York. It was the most listened to broadcast in the city of any preacher and even music station in the city on Sunday afternoon and then again on Sunday evening. Now, we come to Chicago, and it has taken him just a shorter period of time, half the time, two years, because the enemy who tried to attack Minister Farrakhan for what they thought was the getting out of that word through the work of Jesse Jackson ended up making Minister Farrakhan known to this entire community. Now on Sunday afternoon, of all of the preachers on radio, 
Minister Louis Farrakhan is the most listened to preacher in the city of Chicago. All praise is due to our Lord. So, brothers and sisters, this is the second year, and we have, in the, by the help of Allah, we have many more to go in this work. So we want to thank Brother Minister Farrakhan. We pray Allah will continue to bless him, go out with him, come in with him, guide his every word and his every step. Now, this afternoon, we have with us some of the ministers who are helping Minister Farrakhan rebuild the nation of Islam. And I want to introduce them. They're going to come up and speak to you in their own way. We had a very beautiful meeting with the officials of the Nation of Islam this past weekend. Allah blessed us to be able to uh, talk to our brothers and sisters. They stayed over for this celebration, and this celebration this afternoon will continue at the Beverly House at 3 o'clock, and you are invited to come out and share the afternoon with us. First, we'd like to hear from a brother who is handling the city of New York, and as Minister Farrakhan said, that uh, the time that the enemies were challenging the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, it was Malcolm X and a brother known as John Shabazz who moved across the country defending the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. His name now is Abdul Allah Muhammad, and he's in the city of New York handling the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the East Coast region. You've heard him on the radio broadcast here quite a few times in Chicago. I'd like to bring him up first. Let's bring him on with a warm round of applause, Brother Abdul Allah Muhammad. In the most holy name of Allah, whom we forever thank for his servant and our leader and teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and also for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's servant and our leader and teacher in our midst today, Brother Minister Louis Farrakhan. Beloved brothers and sisters, it's a happy occasion always to look into your faces on behalf of Minister Farrakhan, and it's even more of an occasion when we know not only will I look into your face, Faces, but in a few minutes, I'll be also looking into his. We are very proud and very humble and very happy to follow Minister Farrakhan today because we understand the histories and the scriptures. There are many people who misunderstand and think that the great flood that they talk about in religion came about as a result of the sin that was in that area. But the sin had been there a long time, and yet no flood ever came. There are some scientists who try to explain it away as a natural phenomenon of the pressure and the clouds, but the pressure had been there and the clouds had been there. The flood wasn't brought by the clouds and the pressure. The flood wasn't brought by the sins. The flood came about as a result of the presence of a man. When Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, many people think that it was just the actions of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. But they had, those faggots had been switching around there for a whole lot of years, and God had never destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. But Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed because of the presence of a man. And this is where we today have to get intelligent enough and mature enough not to look for anything that will get us out of our condition but a man. When Babylon fell, it was a man named Daniel. When Egypt fell, it was a man named Moses. Everything that God has ever done to change the world has been because of the presence of a man. And I bear witness today, brothers and sisters, that the world... <laughs> The world is undergoing the greatest change it has ever undergone since its existence. And it's not going to undergo it because of an economic philosophy. It's not going to undergo it because of a political philosophy. It's not going to undergo it because of a governmental superstructure or because of social organizations. It's going to undergo it because of the presence of a man. And we're thankful to our law today that that man is coming before us. He is not just a man. He is the man. Can you imagine a man? And I'm so proud to be following him. A man that's so bold. He, is he has laid out a challenge to the most powerful forces in this world. Can you imagine a people so powerful that Henry Ford, with all his money, told the truth about him and they made him publicly apologize? And our leader told the truth about him, and every time they say lighten up, he starts to tighten up. I'm proud to follow <laughs> Minister Louis Farrakhan. Slam <laughs> the
fiery ministers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad who are helping Minister Farrakhan in this mighty work. Next, we'd like to hear from another one of the brothers, fiery brothers. I love his spirit. Minister Farrakhan, as I mentioned to you last week, was just in Miami, Florida with this brother, and they fired the city up. God has blessed him with a tremendous spirit for this work and a tremendous love to help Minister Farrakhan, his love of his minister. And he's so proud to say, I'm a follower of Minister Louis Farrakhan in this mighty work. So I'd like to bring him to the mic, brother who many know as Brother Troy B.R. His name now is Brother Abdul B.R. Muhammad. Let's bring him on with a warm round of applause. God that was to come and has come for our deliverance. And we thank this God whose proper name is Allah, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad for searching among the lost sheep until he found a special lamb. This one he taught for three years and a half. He raised him up in our midst and made him like unto himself, a man after his own heart. And we are thankful to him, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, for blessing you and I in his absence, leaving you and I with the comforter leaving you and I with a warning and the very spirit of truth himself. Yes. Minister Louis Farrakhan. Yes, I greet you, beloved brothers, sisters, visitors, and friends. I shouldn't say visitors or friends. We're all brothers and sisters. The beautiful words of peace be unto you in the beautiful Arabic language. Salam alaikum. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I am honored. I am thankful to God to be in your presence. And I'm thankful to God to be honored by your presence. I am thankful to Minister Farrakhan for allowing me to work with him in the rebuilding of such a beautiful and mighty nation. I want to thank the laborers that work with Minister Farrakhan here in the Chicago area for their wonderful hospitality. Everything has absolutely been great, and I had to really pinch myself. I pinched myself and I said, um, well, you know how it is talking to yourself. I said, self? said, where are you? I noticed all of the angels. And I looked around, and there's Peter. I looked around, disciples of Jesus. That was Gabriel. I said, my gosh, self. I said, I must be in heaven. <laughs> Praise be to Allah. Brothers and sisters, this same spirit of truth, the one that we are representing to you this afternoon, Minister Farrakhan, we are so thankful to God that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad chose him to be over all of us, or his followers, of the Nation of Islam in North America. But as you and I know that once one is chosen or selected, there you have jealousy and envy to set in. Minister Farrakhan started out seven years ago. 
he was speaking to me in Miami. He said, B.I., he said, you know, it's now seven years. And as he mentioned this to me, tears came into my eyes just listening to him talk about the seven years of rebuilding and accepting the mission that God gave Elijah Muhammad. Tears came into my eyes because I knew that I should have been with him from the very beginning. Realizing the magnitude, the size, the importance, and the greatness of the mission that God had given our father, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I knew I should have been with him from the very beginning. For seven years, running from city to city, I began to associate it with the life, the early life, I should say, of God's messenger, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He began on a seven-year run from city to city up and down the East Coast. Minister Farrakhan, seven years running from city to city, state to state, by plane, by car, by boat, all over the country, but not running to save his life, not that he was afraid, but running to save your life. <laughs> running from city to city and state to say, state to save the black people's lives here in America. He knew that God and Elijah had made him the vessel of that mighty, powerful word that God had given the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad had put this word of life within Minister Farrakhan. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad had deposited his message within him. He hasn't been trying to save himself. He hasn't been trying to avoid propaganda and pain. But from city to city to do all that he possibly could for the upliftment of black people in this country. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad knew that today, right now, this very hour, this very minute that we are living in, that you and I would be listening. But listening, we would need a leader. In those days, we wasn't ready. It wasn't our season. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad knew that the time would come when all the black people of America would listen. But for them to listen, they would need a teacher. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad prepared that teacher. He made that teacher the vessel, the vial, the container for the word that God had given him mighty enough to uplift and raise up 40 million dead people here in North America. And that man that he put that in his mouth. <laughs> he preserved that word. He, the container of that word. He deposited that word in Minister Farrakhan. God placed that word in a, a fine holder, a fine container so that he would be able to fulfill the mission of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Because no one else really understood the message. No one. You say, well, my gosh, wasn't there a lot of people listening? Didn't the Honorable Elijah Muhammad have wide audiences? Yes, he did. But that wide audience that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had, they didn't understand the message. They turned that handle loose. No one saw the Honorable Elijah Muhammad like Minister Farrakhan did. No one heard Elijah Muhammad like Farrakhan did. No one believed Elijah Muhammad like Farrakhan did. No one had the faith in Elijah Muhammad 
like Farrakhan did. Yes, we were all looking, but we didn't see. There's a lot of difference in looking and seeing. You heard that song say, you just can't see for looking. Yes, we was all looking, but we didn't see Elijah as he really was, or as he really is. We was listening, but we didn't hear. Farrakhan saw. Farrakhan heard. Farrakhan believed. Farrakhan had the faith. Farrakhan knew that God had produced or made Elijah like unto himself. A man after his own heart. A man with the same mind. A man with the same soul. Elijah Muhammad. But no one understood the message like Farrakhan. They thought everything was going to happen back then. They thought we were ready to get on the mothership. Well, he's here. Brothers and sisters, just bear with me just a few more seconds. You know this will tear you up. <laughs> they didn't realize at the time that that was not the time. But everyone was getting ready at that time to board the mother plane. They had been hearing and singing, swing low, sweet chariot coming far to carry me home. That time wasn't then. They thought it was time for the parting of the Red Sea at that time, but that wasn't the season. They thought it was the time for the whale to give up Jonah's, but that wasn't the time. But brothers and sisters, I bear witness that that wasn't the season, but the season is now. <laughs> and in my final remarks, brothers and sisters, I must say that it is an impossibility to look at Mercury without seeing the sun. All those other stars are out there. They bear witness that the sun is shining somewhere. That's where they receive their likeness. They are bearing witness that the sun is shining somewhere. But when you look at Mercury, you can't see Mercury without looking at the sun. When you look at Mercury, you're looking at the sun. Mercury is swallowed up by the sun. But those other stars, all of those other stars, they're bearing witness that the sun is shining somewhere. Not that the sun is right there, but shining somewhere. They don't know where, like the prophets of the Bible. They said that God was coming. They didn't know where he was. They said he was coming someday. The other stars. But this star, Mercury, you can't see it unless you look at it and the sun at the same time. Mercury is swallowed up by the sun by the lightness of the sun. Mercury is on the lap of the sun. And so is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's representative, who is our guiding star. You can't see Farrakhan without seeing Elijah, and you can't see Elijah without seeing God. Brother Abdul B.R. Muhammad. Let's give him a warm round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we'd like to hear from uh, our sister, who is a scholar in the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and many other areas. But I'd like to bring up quickly Sister Tynetta Muhammad. You've heard her here before on the radio. Let us bring her on with a warm round of applause. <laughs> sister Tynetta Muhammad.
Assalamu alaikum. alaykum. In the most holy name of Allah, the all-wise, true, and living God, who came to us in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom all praise is due forever, for giving to us our divine leader, teacher, guide, and exalted Christ, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, through whom we are eternally grateful for giving to us at this hour, this most important hour in the history of the world, his divine spokesman, national representative, Minister Louis Farrakhan. I greet you again in the nation's greetings of peace and paradise. I salam alaikum. Do you know how important it is in this day and time for us to be able to greet each other as brothers and sisters? And not to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because you don't know if the morning is good or if the afternoon is good or if the evening is good. But to be able to say peace to each other is the eternal expression by which the universe itself was divinely created. So when we say peace be to you, we are going back to the utterance of God's speech in the beginning of what he wanted for you and I to share into eternity. So today we are being prepared to return unto our own, to return on to that our own sacred nation of Islam whose root meaning is peace. So today we are blessed to be able to have with us Muhammad in Minister Louis Farrakhan. We are blessed to be having with us today laborers in this work in the name Muhammad. And do you know what that means? That means that we are getting ready to meet our Lord. Because when the 144,000 were selected out of the masses of our people now swelling to 34, 35 million in America, that means hope for our whole masses of people. Because Muhammad is the name of our father that the scriptures say would be sealed in our foreheads. Is that right? So you don't look anymore for Biya, for Hassan, Hussein. When you look at us, we are forming a solid wall, a solid rank of warriors for Muhammad, being named Muhammad, to be able to move out in the offensive, offensive, not defensive. Because when you attack us, we are one. We are Muhammad, we are Allah, and we will live into the eternity, into a new world of Islam. I thank you for your attention, and I'm going to turn you now into the hands of Brother Akbar Muhammad. And please listen to him as he brings on our dear beloved Minister Louis Farrakhan. Thank you. As salamu alaykum. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, before we bring on Brother Minister Farrakhan, we have one more brother we'd like for you to hear from, and uh, he is a doctor. As a matter of fact, he's a surgeon, and he's doing some transplants of brains in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Getting rid of some old minds and implanting some new minds. So we'd like to hear from Dr. Abdul Ali Muhammad from Washington, D.C. Let's bring him on with a warm round of applause. Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, the all wise, the true, and the living God, who came to you and to me in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. And in the name of our brother, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the exalted Christ, who crystallized one into oneness with himself, Minister Louis Farrakhan, I greet you in their names in the greeting words of peace and paradise. Assalamu alaikum. How are you all this evening? I'm fine as well and highly honored to be privileged enough to stand before the people who are God's choice in this hour and bear witness to the truth that we have received from the Lord of the world. I'm from Washington, D.C., and I'm very proud to represent Minister Louis Farrakhan in Washington, D.C., because Washington, D.C. is the seat of the most wicked government that has ever existed on the face of the earth. It is a great honor, it's a great privilege to have uh, the blessing to be able to speak the truth in a world that has been dedicated to falsehood and deceit. 
a world that has been dedicated to oppression and the enslavement of mankind around the world and the center of that deceit and that oppression and that enslavement of the minds of the people is right there in Washington, D.C. So I thank Allah and I thank the Christ and I thank Minister Farrakhan for giving me that great privilege to stand up and just back up what our brother is saying. And let me say to the world that may be listening, that you better leave our brother alone. <laughs> leave him alone. <laughs> Praise is due to Allah. But I don't like Muhammad. <laughs> Praise is due to Allah. But I don't like Muhammad. <laughs> Thank you. Why do I say that? Because you don't know who you're messing with. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is the Christ. The Christ is a word that comes from the Greek language, which is Christos, which translates to mean crystal. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is therefore a man that is crystallized into a oneness with God. When you see the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you see God. When you hear him, you are hearing God, and he has crystallized another one into unity with himself. So therefore, when you see Minister Farrakhan, you are looking at a man that is crystallized into oneness with God. You are looking at a man that bears in his internal structure the very characteristics and virtues of God. When you see Minister Farrakhan, he exemplifies all of the characteristics of a crystal. Look at a man wearing glasses. The lenses of his glasses are ground so that they transmit the light and they correct the distortion that is produced by an imbalance in his vision. Is that right? When you look at a crystal, there are those who claim that by looking into the internal structure of a crystal ball that they can foresee the future. Is that right? Look at the watch on your arm. It's called a quartz crystalline watch. Is that right? And by the vibration of that crystal that is embedded in that watch, you are able to tell the time. Is that right? A crystal is a very powerful instrument of God. By means of a crystal, a man can look at that which cannot be seen by the naked eye. By, by means of a lens that is crystalline, he can see that which cannot be seen. By means of a crystalline lens, one is able to view stars and worlds that are so far from our own world that with the naked eye they are invisible. Is that right? Yes, what gives the crystal its great power? It is the fact that its internal structure has been completely rearranged and purified. A crystal is composed of elements that are alike and that are arranged in a regular array so that there is no imbalance, so that there is no impurity, so that there is no impediment to the passage of light. Look at your TV set. Look at your radio. What is the basis of your ability to receive a signal through a radio or through a TV set? There is a crystal that is vibrating according to the frequency of a broadcast that's coming from a powerful transmitter. Is that right? Praise is not to Allah. Muhammad. So therefore, if a crystal is pure enough, if a crystal is clean enough, if the structure, the internal structure of a crystal is good enough, then that crystal becomes something that is of priceless value. Why do you love a diamond? Why do you love a ruby? It's because it's something that is so pure that it uh, obtains an appearance that is attractive to the eye. So we are saying to the world today that we have the most priceless gem and jewel of Islam that has ever existed on the face of the earth in our brother, Minister Louis Farrakhan Muhammad. Praise is due to Allah, but I don't really like Muhammad. Praise is due to Allah, but I don't really like Muhammad. So when you watch this man, Minister Farrakhan, in motion, in action, it's like the vibration of a crystal that is telling you what time it is. When you receive light 
from this crystallized man, Minister Louis Farrakhan. Don't think that the light is emanating from himself, but it's merely being transmitted through the purity of his, in of his in integral structure from God himself through the Christ, through this man. So when you mess with this man, you're messing with something that is beyond your control. It's beyond your ability because a diamond is so pure that it becomes the hardest substance that is known to man. So when you fall on the diamond, you don't break the diamond, but you're broken yourself. When you try to cut the diamond, you don't cut the diamond, but the diamond cuts you. So you better watch yourself when you mess with Minister Farrakhan. There's one more characteristic about a crystal that most people are not aware of. A crystal is actually a generator of power. It generates power because of the uh, atomic structure of which it is composed, such that any time that a force is used to try to bend or distort the crystal, it actually generates a power from within the crystal to resist that distortion. So that means that the more that the world comes against Minister Farrakhan, the more there is a divine display of power coming from this man. And it means, praises are due to Allah, but I will be Muhammad. It means that any attack against Minister Farrakhan is an attack against God himself. Any attack against any of those who are also crystallized into a oneness with the Christ, I mean the brothers and the sisters of the nation of Islam, black men and women everywhere who will stand up behind Minister Farrakhan, black men and women, white men and women, anyone who will stand uh, like soldiers in a rank or in a fire, like pilgrims, standing in the prayer service of Islam, arrayed in ranks. If they will stand with this man, then they have no need to fear the power of this evil world. Because the power of God will be transmitted through the Christ, through Minister Farrakhan, and through this entire nation of black people. So I say don't mess with Minister Farrakhan, but don't mess with any of those who are followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and believers in the Christ. Thank you for listening. May Allah bless you with peace. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Dr. Abdul Aleem Muhammad from Washington, D.C. Now, brothers and sisters, I know we're down to time on the radio broadcast. I guess Minister Farrakhan said, I might as well sit here. <laughs> but I want to say this, and then we want to bring the minister right on. September has been a very important month for us. Uh, and it's a very important month in the life of Minister Farrakhan. Not only are we celebrating this month, the second anniversary in this building, but it's the seventh year of the work of Minister Farrakhan in rebuilding the nation of Islam. Also, Minister Farrakhan was married in September. He just celebrated his 31st uh, anniversary, married for 31 years. And before we bring him on, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad just dropped something on us one day. He said that uh, the scholars really don't know when Jesus was born. He certainly was not born December the 25th. But they think it was around the first or second week of September. Right. Let us bring on Brother Minister Louis Farrakhan. of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the One God, to whom all praise is due, the Lord of the worlds. And we thank Allah over and over again for blessing us with our beloved leader, teacher, and guide, the Messenger of Allah, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I greet you, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace in the Arabic language. Assalamu alaikum. 
Brothers and sisters, I am so excited by what I've been hearing here today. I feel like I ought to just sit down and let my brothers and sisters tell us more. <laughs> Not that uh, I'm so anxious to hear these fine uh, words of myself, but they really edify me also. As a man is working, he's not looking at himself. God can't use a man if the man is centered on himself. Vanity is something that Almighty God hates. We are small atoms that come into being and in a short while we vanish. It is only Allah who is permanent. None come to Allah according to the teachings of the Holy Quran but as an honored servant. The prophets of Allah are all considered his servants, none his equal. So when a womb or the womb of a woman brings forth a child or children that are going to help make a change in the world. It fills the people with great joy, but it also should fill the people with eternal gratitude to the source of all goodness and purity and truth, which is Almighty God. We are not a people to worship personalities. We recognize that our personalities are valuable, but they are not eternal. So we want to worship Allah and worship the truth for it is only Allah and the truth that will outlive our personalities and it is only Allah and the truth that make our person and our personalities worthwhile observing. And it is only Allah and the truth and the principles of the truth which make up the character of us that makes us examples for others. So today, in the few minutes that we're going to be on this radio broadcast, I wanted to make a few uh, brief points in our subject matter. It's a very big subject, but we're going to try and cover it in a very short time. The Spirit of Almighty God, whose proper name is Allah, is moving over the waters. Waters, according to the scripture, means people. And as the Spirit of God moves among the people, men and women of consequence are being produced all over the world to bring about an eternal change in the structure of government and world affairs. Leaders are being produced here and there in every community on this earth. God is manifesting his own intervention in the affairs of men by bringing up or raising up men and women who will not bow or bend to the powers of evil that rule this present world. I'm very grateful to have met the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and to be one of those kind of men that look at the power of this world like one of those stars out there. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, they're just gas. 
that is lit but easy to blow out if you know how. This world's light is now going out. And for us to bend and bow to the power of this world whose time to rule is up is to sentence ourselves to the death that God is imposing on the world. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. Mr. Reagan cannot keep America afloat. He does not have the vision, the wisdom, the will, nor the power. He may have the will, but he certainly doesn't have the vision, the knowledge, nor the power to keep America afloat. The Western world can't stay afloat. In fact, the governments of the nations of the earth can't stay afloat. There's a new world order coming in. And there is no power in the heavens above or in the earth beneath that can stop the coming in of that order. That order is, the, is powered by the will of God. Listen. My brother... Dr. Abdul Aleem Muhammad, and doctor is all right, but minister is better. And my sister, Tanera Muhammad, and Brother Abdul Bia Muhammad, and Brother Abdul Allah Muhammad, these wonderful words spoken by these representatives of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad saying to the world that something has happened in America and let the whole earth take notice. Don't criticize it. Try to understand what is happening in America. It is a miracle right in front of your very eyes. The government of the United States along with other governments of the world, including some Islamic governments, worked to see the nation of Islam destroyed. With Elijah Muhammad gone and the nation destroyed and other black organizations wiped out and black leaders cut down, the government authorities felt that they had done the impossible. They had destroyed the messenger and the message, and they had nothing to fear anymore. But little did they know that the best knower and the best planner had planned something way back before we entered the womb of our mother, the plan was operative. And when the genetic and molecular makeup was being formed, coded in the genes of the child, was a mission and a message. He don't have to get it from the Quran or the Bible. The Quran and the Bible is the witness of the man. That when the time was right, and the season would, was right. He would stand up, crystallize, as brother said, into oneness with a man that you have not known, Elijah Muhammad. You have not known Elijah Muhammad, and the world has not known him. He was a shadowy figure on the world stage. My brothers and sisters in the Islamic world, 
when they heard that Elijah Muhammad was saying in the West that he was a messenger of Allah, their emotions clouded their vision. And they said, but Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. And I say to them, you are right. But which one? You cannot say, listen, that the room needs no more sweepers and all the sweepers have swept. And this is the last sweeper and there's dirt left in the room after the man has finished sweeping. Listen good. If Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, is the last of the prophets and messengers of God, then the world should be in a better condition now than it was before he was born because he ended prophecy. He gave us the final book, the final message, so we should have cleansed the earth. But Muhammad himself in the Hadith said that one would come out of his family who would be named Muhammad. And he said that one is called Mahdi or Ahmed. And that one would set justice in the earth. That's a big order. Muhammad was not telling us to look for a spirit or a spook. Muhammad was telling us to look for a man, but a man extraordinary. Extraordinary in that this man would have the power to set justice in the earth. And what is justice? It is righteousness. And any time a man has the power to set righteousness in the earth, he must have the power to set down nations and governments that are unrighteous and set up governments and nations that are righteous. This is why all over the earth today, even though the people say, listen to me carefully, that God cannot be seen. He's an unseen reality. But the Chinese found what they were looking for in Mao Zedong. They didn't find it in a spook. They found it in a man. Is that right? In Cuba, the Cubans found it in Fidel Castro. The Vietnamese found it in Ho Chi Minh. Is that right? The Libyans have found it in Brother Muammar Gaddafi. You're not looking for a spirit. You are looking for a man to take you out of this condition. that sit on their prayer rugs and wait on a mystery God to change things will be sitting there and their children will sit there and things will remain as they are. The Quran teaches us that Allah will never change the condition of a people until they change it themselves. You must have the will to change the conditions under which you live. And then when we organize and work together as a unit, we can change the conditions. But there must be the presence, as Brother Abdullah Muhammad said, of a man. The flood came as a result of the people's rejection of a man. His presence sentenced them to death when they rejected him. Just remember that. Because when God gives you a man to answer the critical needs of a people and you reject him, and that man is the means by which 
we justify our own existence, then we negate our own existence or we cancel out our right to exist. And your right to exist is affirmed by your affirmation of a man who has a plan from God for your own deliverance. And when you reject that man, he turns from you and says peace to you and goes his way. And then the chastisement of Allah overtakes the disbeliever. Listen. The presence of a man. The world is in worse condition today than it was in the time of Prophet Muhammad, Jesus, and Moses, and all the other prophets. The world needs a man, but not an ordinary man. An ordinary man cannot handle what this world has to offer. In fact, if I may be considered blunt, no prophet could handle the world condition today. If you brought Moses back, Moses would have to go and find God and say, I can't handle this. Not with what God gave Moses 4,000 years ago. As much as you love Jesus, the man that lived 2,000 years ago that rode around on a camel or a donkey, he couldn't handle this modern world. Not with the wisdom he had back there then. I'm sorry about that. Lot talked to just a few homosexuals in Sodom and Gomorrah. If Lot were to come alive today and you sent him to San Francisco, Lot would run and hide. <laughs> Elijah Muhammad never said he was a prophet. There's no need for a prophet. Prophets can't handle this work. In fact, the name or the title prophet is not such a, you know, big title. Our crazy people love to put it on others. Oh, he's a prophet. Oh, he, he's a prophet. Prophets came and were shot down. Some were sent to prison. You don't need nobody that don't have power. Prophets were beaten, prophets were jailed, prophets were killed because a prophet can't handle a God. He comes out from a God. The God of this world had power over all the prophets. The most successful prophet that ever lived was Prophet Muhammad, and his work today is all but destroyed. The Muslim world is at each other's throat. If Prophet Muhammad were to come back alive today, he would start in Mecca and tear it up and clean it up all over again. Is that right? So, what is needed today is not a prophet. We need men that are empowered by a divine source to overcome the God of this world. Yes, right. Not a prophet. Nothing to prophesy. We got it all here in the Quran and the Bible. That's all what the prophet spoke. Elijah came in the Old Testament and said, this ends the prophets. That's right. That's right. Here ended the prophets. Well, then we don't talk about prophets. We don't need prophets today. We thank them for coming. Thank God for sending them. Thank God for their knowledge. Prophets spoke things that they themselves didn't understand. You better listen. The prophets didn't understand everything they said because everything that God revealed to a prophet was not for his day. 
some things that the prophet was made to say was for hundreds of years down the road and the prophet himself couldn't see the root of the wisdom that he himself spoke. He was left out of it. He, that's why Paul said, I see darkly, dimly. Prophets got their visions in the night. Well, that tells you something. Carried me out in the night, and I had a vision. What does the night mean? In the time of your ignorance, he showed you something. How do you know you understood all that you saw? You can tell us what you saw, but the interpretation and the depth of the wisdom of what you saw is with the one who gave you the vision. And God didn't reveal to Moses. All that Moses taught, or the wisdom of what Moses taught. This is why it is written in the Quran, if Moses were to come back and hear the last one speak, he would fall down in a swoon. If he understood, it's too much for them. We don't need a prophet. We got what we need. That's right. And if you doubt that our mighty God has intervened in the affairs of black people in America. I ask you, by what power? What power? By what power does a black man from Georgia with a fourth grade education stand up in America and preach her doom without an army and without weapons and put a word out of his mouth that reforms a savage people that America has destroyed. And at the same time that he is whipping or challenging the power of the world, he's raising a people up from mental, moral, spiritual, social, political, and economic death. That is the power of God. I say to my Muslim Brothers and sisters of the Orthodox Islamic world, study the attributes of Allah. And if you bear witness that Allah is the mighty and the wise, then I ask you to look at us. And if this is not a work of might in the midst of a vicious beast, and if this is not a work of wisdom, that as we move in the midst of the beast, or as David the psalmist says, in the valley of the shadow of death, and the beast has no power to harm us, then surely the mighty and the wise is among us. Look, there are people all over the world that fear America's power. She's the most powerful powerful government on earth but we who have been taught by the honorable Elijah Muhammad we fear none but Allah and yea though we walk in the valley of the shadow of death we fear no evil we're not planning revolution we make a revolution Revolution is so powerful that we need not go in secret places and plan it. We just speak the truth and watch that which is built on falsehood come tumbling down. We turn the minds of black people over. We turn the minds of white people over. We turn the minds of Jews over with this word. They are writing me now. Whites, Jews, Germans, saying, we believe. Listen to what I'm saying. They say, we believe in you, Farrakhan. Say, we know what you're saying is true, but we just didn't have the courage to say it. Thank you for saying about the Jews that which is true. I'm telling you what white folks are writing me. 
Jews write me and say, wait a minute. You are condemning Jews. I want you to condemn Zionists. And there's a difference between Zionists and Jews. I know what I'm doing. There is a difference between Zionism and Judaism. We got into that one in Miami last week. And a Jew was telling me, but you condemn Judaism as a gutter or a dirty religion. I said, no, no. No. I said, your religion is not what you believe. Your religion is what you practice. And if you practice lying, stealing, murder, deceit, and thievery, that's a dirty religion that you're practicing. I said, I said, but I went a little further. I said, the name Judaism, that is not a revealed name of God for a religion. That's your made up name. Put on what God revealed to Israel through Moses. We don't know anything about a name named Judaism. That's right. I mean, the Jew got quiet. Yeah. Come on, brothers. Go ahead. Yes, sir. I said, and we don't know anything about a name called Christianity. I said, that's your name. That's Allah didn't reveal Christianity as a name. He didn't reveal Judaism as a name. He revealed what he revealed and he never gave his religion a name. Not until the Quran was revealed. He said the true religion with Allah is Islam or obedience or submission to the will of God. Read your Bible from one cover to another. You will not find the name Judaism mentioned as the religion of Abraham. You will not find Christianity mentioned as the religion of Jesus. It just said they taught peace. That the way of God is peace. My peace I leave with you. Peace I give you. Is that right? Yes, sir. How do you get peace with God? You get it by obedience and submission to his will. Not my will be done. Jesus said, thy will be done. That is Islam. That is a Muslim. And that is what you were born by nature. You don't have to join it. You are Islam. teaches us that Islam is the nature of God and the nature in which he created man and I am a created man not a made man and you are created man and woman then your nature is the same as the nature of God himself your nature is righteousness anything other than that is what circumstances and society has made you but you are born of God you didn't hear me I said, you are born of God. You are born of the righteous. Your nature and God's nature is one and the same nature. So you can't convert me to Islam. I reject you coming to me. Talking about we want to convert you. How can you convert me and I'm born a Muslim? <laughs> So when you wake me up, if I say to you that I am a dead man, what is dead? My arms move, my tongue is moving, my feet are moving, but what is dead? It is the nature of God in me that has been put to sleep under the false teaching of an enemy or adversary to God. This is why America, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, she's the real devil. You don't
don't need a devil under the ground when you're dead. You got a real live devil on top of the ground giving you hell all the days of your life and there will be no peace. There will be no peace in the valley until the devil's power to raise hell has been broken. This is why every Muslim, every black person, every natural born creature of God must be awakened. And when you are awakened and the spirit of God and the nature of God is awakened in you, then the power of God in you is resurrected and you become crystallized into oneness with the source of your nature. This is why when a man attacked Farrakhan, he says, oh, we got him. Let's put our powerful media on him. I say, help yourself. You can't destroy God with media attention. Are you saying, Farrakhan, that you are God? Oh, no. I'm saying that my nature is the nature of God. And when I'm in harmony with the God who created my nature, you can't do nothing with me but what you do to my father, and that is bow down in submission. Islam. That's the power. It's your nature. You got plenty of power. There's not one of you that don't have power, but your power has been killed under falsehood. When you believe in a mystery God, got him all out there in space. I see my Muslim brothers and sisters around the world praying to Allah and then sitting down. I know Allah is going to hear me. Go ahead, brothers. Go ahead. I read in a book about uh, Allah was about to destroy a town. And one of the angels <coughs> said to Allah, one of your righteous servants is in that town. Allah said, destroy the town. Because if he, he was so righteous, he would have been working to reform the town. In other words, in other words, no matter who and what you are, if you will not work the power of your being to change the condition then you are equally as guilty as the conspirators of evil. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, sir. This old uh, effeminate religion, you know what I mean when I say effeminate religion. It's limp. Yes, sir. That's it. It has no backbone. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm righteous. I. <laughs> Hallelujah. God be praised. What makes you righteous? You see, I don't smoke. I don't drink. I won't fornicate and I won't commit adultery. I don't smoke dope. And I say all my prayers every day. And I give whatever I can in charity. Yes, sir. And what else do you do? But what do you mean, what else? Is there something else? That's nothing. That's vanity. So you don't smoke. So what? So you don't drink. You don't use drugs. So what? What are you doing? 
to better the condition of others. What are you doing to reform where you live? And if you do nothing to reform society with the knowledge you have received, then you are guilty of concealing knowledge. And that is a cardinal sin. This is why God is going to uproot Mecca. Because if you are righteous, it is not seen in ceremonial pilgrimage. Your righteousness is seen in changing the condition of the people and making the people responsible for their lives not making slaves out of them yes, did you hear me yes, sir. my Muslim brothers and sisters did not understand Elijah Muhammad and what he taught he said that Allah came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad. Stop right there. When we say something like that, our Muslim brothers and sisters say, oh my God, this is shirk. This is kafir. They're disbelievers. No, 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 no. Shh. Listen, listen. How do you know Allah? Every prophet brought us a different name for the God. Is that right? Wait a minute, listen to me good now. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Every prophet brought a different name. Yahweh, yes, Jehovah, the omnipotent, the omniscient, is that right? Yes, sir. When it came to Jesus, called him Abba, Father, Prophet Muhammad, referred to him as Allah. The name had been known, but the people who knew the name didn't have the substance behind that name. They knew the name Allah in Arabia, but they didn't know the characteristics of the God. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the revelation of the Quran brought us closer to a real view of the God. Hear me now, please. We watch the evolution of religious development from Abraham to Muhammad. I said the evolution of religious development because 5,000 years ago when Abraham taught there were things that those people needed that you don't need right now. Some things you do need. Abraham's message was simple, clear for that day, for that time, but there's an eternal principle that is needed in 1984. Prayer was different then. Abraham prayed. He lifted up his hand. He bowed down. Is that right? Yes, but prayer had not the form that it had when Prophet Muhammad taught prayer. Is that right? Yes, well, what do you know about that? What do you see in that? God allowed prayer to evolve. Charity evolve sacrifice evolve from the sacrifice of animals right some savage tribes would sacrifice human 
life to the fire gods. Is that right? Yes, but Abraham makes a sacrifice of his son. And then in the New Testament, Jesus is a sacrifice. Is that right? Yes, so sacrifice <clears throat> evolves from Genesis through to Revelation where you see the gradual growth of religion from a, what we would call a nationalistic kind of religion and a nationalistic kind of God to a universal concept of God. Is that right? Yes, sir. You hear in the Old Testament, the God of Israel. That's a particular God. The God of that people, that state. When you reach the New Testament, you don't hear about the God of Israel anymore. Is that right? You hear about Abba, Father. When you reach Muhammad, peace be upon him, he doesn't talk about the God of Israel, nor Abba or Father. He calls him Rabbil Alameen. The Lord, the nourisher, the sustainer, the evolver of all of the worlds. Religion is an ever evolving, progressive thing. Hear me well. Religion is an ever evolving, progressive thing. Whenever religion stops its motion, it begins to enslave the people. You are not under a religion right now that frees. You are under religion that enslaves. In fact, most of you religious people are slaves. You didn't hear me? Yes, sir. You're slaves. Well, wait a minute. I'm not a slave. I'm free. No, not quite. You are a slave to a concept of religion and a concept of God that you have outgrown. And any time you force a people to hold on to a concept that they have already outgrown, you are making them a slave. And I must say this, in the Islamic world, the reason that there's so much unrest among the Muslims is because they have outgrown the concepts that have been previously understood and taught in religion and they hunger for an evolution to a higher stage and because the mullahs and the religious leaders, the sheikhs do not have that understanding they will kill the people and call them heretics or hypocrites or disbelievers simply because they hunger for a greater growth in religion. I say this with the deepest of humility. The religion of Islam as taught in the East could never convert the masses of people in the West. Your minds have evolved. Even though we are degenerate, your minds have evolved till you hunger and thirst for a development in religion that you have not yet been presented with. And that's why you go to church and you must be entertained, but you are not fed. Did you hear me? In the Islamic world, I see the people sitting there listening to the Imam make his khutbah or his sermon on Friday. And you can look in their eyes and see that they are no longer moved by what the Imam is saying because they hunger for another development. And it is not in the Imams. It is not in the mullahs. It is not in the scholars. So the scholars can only try to hold the people with mysticism. 
with spookism. But once a child outgrows your ability to make him afraid of God's wrath or man's wrath, then you have a full-scale rebellion on your hands. Your children right now, mothers, are rebelling against your way of religion. They hunger for something better. I watched this morning on television and I saw Reverend Shuler and they were calling people down to drink the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's pretty cold. Making vampires out of you once a month. <laughs> and if I told you today, look, uh, sister, I want a little blood to drink. <laughs> You'd say, that Farrakhan's a very strange guy, you know? <laughs> Go on, brother. Go ahead. <laughs> the scripture tells you you don't drink the blood of any creature because the health and disease of all of us is contained in the blood so you don't drink blood but the blood of Jesus is different no he was a human being well just a minute he was pure yeah but not pure blood Y'all all right? Yes, sir. All right, let all the modern day vampires listen. Yes, sir. Listen. You hunger for something better. That can't hold you. I visited my old church few months ago when I came back from Libya I was a guest at my old church they wanted me to preach there and they had communion that day and they asked me uh, would you come and sip some wine and and eat some bread I said no thank you, you go right ahead <laughs> I wanted to help them I saw them coming to the altar Looking very sanctimonious, you know. <laughs> These people that had raised hell all Saturday night all right. All right. had just barely gotten stuff out their eyes Sunday morning. They were looking holy and. I watch Muslims go to Juma prayer on Friday, but it's the same ritual. We are programmed to do this, so we go, Juma. We dress up, we go to Juma. We make our prayer, but the prayer has no more meaning. What does this mean? I don't know. I just see everybody else do this. <laughs> what does this mean? Hey, well, well, hey. I mean, what does that mean? <laughs> what does this mean? What does prostration mean? Why do you prostrate? Well, I, it's the way we found our fathers. That's not good enough. What is the meaning of it? Why do you pray five times a day? Why sometimes seven? Why at the time? Why is there a seven hour interval between your morning prayer and your noon prayer? But from 12 to uh, your noon prayer to your evening prayer, the prayers speed up. Why? Why the times fixed? What does it mean? I don't know. Well, then what are you doing it for? I really don't know but I do it. So what happens is the Muslim world takes on the form of religion 
but it's like a golden calf. It has no spirit in it. You listening to me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Why do you go to Mecca? That's what we're supposed to do. Fine. Why do you camp in the plain of Arafat? Why do you throw stones at Shaitan? What does it mean? I don't know. What does the Kaaba mean? Does it have a meaning? Why do you walk around it? Why don't you go straight to it? Why must you walk in, in order and make a circle around it seven times? What does it mean? I don't know. Why is the stone in the particular corner that it's in? I don't know. Why don't you know? Well, I wasn't taught. Well, then somebody needs to teach them. That's right. Huh? Otherwise, Muslims are going to grow up like the Christians growing up today with no real spirit for religion. You're just in it. You're a Christian, but you're just in it. Tell the truth. You don't know nothing about it. What, what you mean? I mean just what I said. You don't know nothing about it. Well, I, I know this. What is it that you know? Jesus was born of a virgin. How so? What virgin? Which one? Well, her name was Mary. Who told you that? Why wasn't it Martha? How was she a virgin? How could she have a baby and be a virgin? Well, God can do anything you want to do. Well, why did he break his own law and do it that way? Talk to us. You don't know. Your children want answers. The babies want to know how the virgin get a baby. You say, well, you got to believe, honey. But the baby said, I want to know. <laughs> Don't come to me with belief. I want to know, mama. How did the virgin have a baby? What answer are you going to give her? <laughs> well, well. On, that's why I'm going to the well. I want some water, mama. <laughs> Religion really is trapping the minds of the people. It is not freeing your mind so you can cope with the modern world. Religion is not a, a, an enslaving device. Religion is a tool of service. If you can't use it to find your way in the world, then you don't need it. What do you need religion for? To make a preacher fatter, richer, and yourself poorer and dumber? Just for you to sing in the choir and run around and jump and holler and spit and foam? Go ahead, Come on. What do you need religion for in the Middle East? I'm talking to you. Your people sitting there with a Quran, which is the light, and the people's heads are wrapped in a napkin of darkness. How in the hell can you tell me you got the light and the world is flying and you walking around or riding on a camel wondering how you gonna modernize your world and you got the book in your hand. Religion is an enslaving thing if it doesn't follow the evolutionary law and principle of growth and development. I was in Libya recently and I studied Brother Muammar Gaddafi. God gave to Africa a wonderful son in that brother. He's far beyond his own people. He's far beyond many who listen to what he says but have not grasped the meaning and the principles of what Brother Gaddafi is teaching. If we are not careful, we 
will miss what he is instructing. As I watch and see by the grace of Almighty God, I see a man who recognizes the power of the individual, the greatness of the individual. I am not greater than you, except if I am more dutiful in the way of God, then I'm doing a greater work than you, but that yet does not make me greater if you wake up to the nature of yourself and start working according to your nature, then you and I are equal. Government has been set up to rule the people and the people remain ignorant and the governments suck the blood of the people an elite kind of thing. Our brothers, the Hebrew Israelites are here. Let us give them a wonderful round. Now see. I just, I just want to say to our Muslim brothers from Africa that Allah said those who are Jews and those who are Sabians, those who believe in Allah and the last day, they have their reward with their Lord. These Hebrew Israelites and Muslims, we get along as one family. The argument between Jews and Arabs are not present between us because we recognize the oneness of God. Now let me get back to where I was. Where was I? What is that? Muammar Gaddafi sees that the individual must be responsible and the real ruling and governing power should really be the people not in word but in fact. Now of course, this is my humble opinion, when you have a people coming up out of colonialism, you cannot give the people more power than the people are ready to assume. If you do, you create chaos. I'm not being paternalistic. Listen to me carefully. A, a mother that brings a baby in the world does not give the baby power. The baby evolves into power. Did you hear me? Yes. What you give your baby is the breast to feed it, to nurture it. And if you nurture it properly, it grows into power. And it grows to power to such a degree where it outgrows dictatorship. Are you listening? Yes, sir. It outgrows dictatorship. But what is the first form of government in your house? What is it? When you came in the world, did you offer your mother any, any uh, words of counsel? <laughs> did your mother consult you? Heavy decisions. Did she wake you up in the crib at night and say, we must have a talk? If she did, you would have cried till morning because all you wanted was the breast. Is that right? So she gave you what you wanted and her either alone in consultation with God or with your father made the decisions for your life. And as long as you were nurtured, fed properly, your intellect grew. That's right. Your hope and your expectations for the world grew as your intelligence grew. 
And then when you became a rational being, you would not submit to dictatorship anymore. Then you told your mother, Ma, I think we can do it better if we go this way. When you start talking to your mother, reasoning with her, then she has an alternative. She has to give up the old form of government. Yes, sir. Or she got to put you out. Yes, sir. Is that right? Yes, Come on with me. Yes, now, bear with me just a few more minutes. I'm so happy to see you. But I want you to listen now, please. Dictatorship gives way to a form of government that demonstrates the rational or the growth of rational understanding among the people. When the people's self-interest is enlightened, they will vote for that which is best for themselves then the people can govern for they have the rational understanding to govern themselves listen to me carefully beloved power to the people is a slogan we cannot run a government on a slogan Certainly, we want power to the people, but how do you give power to the people? How do you make the people's power felt? Please follow me. God, this is important. First, if the nature of God in the people is asleep, then the power of the people to make right decisions for themselves is dead. And you cannot leave government in the hands of a people who are mentally, morally, spiritually, socially, and politically dead because the power of the nature of God in them sleeps. Somebody whom God selects as a mother for you. Yes, you didn't hear me. Yes, as a mother for you. That's why any man that has sense. Will honor and respect womanhood. Because without a mother. No nation can grow to self-government to true democracy. Muammar Gaddafi is not the father of Libyan independence. He's the mother of Libyan people into revolution that will make them a true democracy. But the people are being nurtured from him as a teacher. Listen. But if the people do not take in the teachings, internalize the message, then the white man is racing against time to kill the mother. You didn't hear me. The government of America wants Gaddafi dead before the revolution is internalized in the hearts and minds of the Libyan people. America wanted Castro dead before the Cuban people could internalize his message. They don't want the message to become a part of you. But any true message any true message is in harmony, in congruence, in sympathy to the very nature in which you are created. So it feeds your nature, not your mind. When it feeds your nature, your nature begins to burst like an atom shooting thoughts to the brain. 
that are harmonious with the nature. You become alive mentally. But that explosion has to be governed by strong law so that it doesn't destroy itself. Then when it's governed by law, it takes on a form and a government and a nation and a people evolve. This is why I say to Muslims and to Christians and to the world, if you disrespect the prophets, you can never find the answer that you are seeking. Each prophet, like a mother, nurtured the baby. You got it? Abraham took the children so far. Turned them over to Lot. Lot took them so far, then Moses. Moses being a major mother, a major mother, mm -hmm. left enough food to nourish people for 2,000 years. The man was a storehouse of wisdom. Yes. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Jesus, they came as mothers with food. There it is, the Quran, the Bible, food for the growth, for the evolutionary development of the people so that they could become into the very mind and spirit of God. Listen. But what happens? The people begin to take their doctors of law and their monks for gods beside Allah. You, the people, become lazy. You don't want to study for yourself. Right. You want to give it to your brother. Right. Oh, well, he reads books. He'll read for me. Then you begin bowing to your mullahs, to your sheikhs and your imams, and you forget that obedience is due only to Allah. Now you start worshiping men as you ought to worship Allah. You begin to fear men as you ought to fear Allah. And the evolutionary development stops. And you start corrupting your leaders by giving them more power and more praise than they're actually worth. <laughs> See, you made Jim Jones. You can't blame Jim Jones. You puffed him up with your stupidity. Yes, that's the him. That's, that's, that's the one. He said, I am? <laughs> so I'm not going to let you do that to me. I'm not going to let you do that to me. Because I know who and what I am. I am your brother. I am, as brother said, a crystal from that major crystal. No doubt about that. But I am no more than what you are. And I refuse to let you make me more than what you are when my job is to make you what you're supposed to be or at least to help. And I can't make you that if I try to show myself as supreme. I want you to see the supremacy of God and the supremacy of man when he's related to God. Look. Listen now. Kwame Nkrumah, look at our great African brother. A brilliant visionary. A mother of Ghana, a mother of Africa, kill the mother. Don't let that mother nourish the baby with the milk in his mind. He'll bring up a product that we can't control. This is why they want foreign students to come to America. Bring me your tides, your poor students. When I get finished, they'll be tired of working for their own people. 
I'll baptize them in the good life. That's what they call it. I'll make them partying, hip swinging, disco, wine drinking, even a little pig eating. And then I'll send them back. Knowing that when I sent them back, I've gone back in them. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. So in every African government, the Africans cannot find their scholars. They're in London. Yeah. They're in France. Yeah. They're in America. Yeah. They're everywhere. There's a dollar because they love money more than they love the advancement of their people. Yeah. This is a false knowledge. Yeah. It is a corruption. Yes, sir. You don't need democracy. Not now. You're too dead to choose anything. <laughs> you better listen now. Now, just a moment, Farrakhan. That's what you say. I, 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 I got a mind. Yeah, but somebody else is mine in your mind. <laughs> Look at you, you can't choose a wife and stay with her three months. Look at the lies you tell. I, John, take thee, Jane, to be my lawfully wedded Tarzan, I mean, wife. How long is it gonna last? Till death. Death! Hurry up and get this ceremony over. I got business to take care of. Three months later, here they come. She with one eye reaching the wall. These brutalizing scratch. We can't make it. She ain't this and he ain't that. Well, I, she can't cook. She's stupid. And you're nasty leaving your stinking socks everywhere. They were, you mean to tell me you knew how to choose? You didn't do too well, did you? Poor fella. I'm in college. What did you choose? Well, I, I have a course in civil rights. What, what, what other quote? Well, I am in Afro American history. I'm getting a BS in that. <laughs> you come out of the college with your degree in your hand, lifting up your lamp, and nobody sees your light. Because you don't have none. Spent four years, blew all that money and come out with something you can't use because you know how to choose? The leaders you choose are crazy as you are. You choose leaders that don't do nothing for you. That's my man. What make him your man? Ain't he sharp? And did you get the point? You don't need to be given democracy. No. Hell no, you, you're a long way from democracy. Any type of democracy for you will end up hypocrisy because you're so crazy. You choose people by the diamonds they wear. I mean, if the Muslims hadn't given me this ring, I would never have worn it. I haven't worn a diamond in a long time. And this other piece of gold, a Christian preacher gave it to me as a symbol of friendship, so I wear it. But, you know, we don't use these things. But some of you get so fascinated. Oh, look, it sparkles. Good God. I'm trying to sparkle knowledge. You're saying, oh, look at his hair. Your mind is carried away with frivolous things. 
if I came in here with a cape and threw it back. <laughs> Get a little magic. You always say, now that's the prophet, honey. <laughs> if I had a bunch of silly women rolling carpet down, so when I came down, it would look like I was, what do you call that thing? Levitating. <laughs> you say, oh, hey, come. Because you crazy. You just want people to give you a show. You voted for Jesse. I voted for Jesse. But in reality, what is it that you voted for him for? Tell the truth. You said, look, one of the slaves want to be Pharaoh. And the rest of the slaves say, he crazy, ain't he? And so you say, I like it. Because I want to be Pharaoh too. See, most of you, Y'all all right? See, most of you, if the white man dropped dead tomorrow, we would be the white man all over again the day after tomorrow. No good. See, most of us want the white man to die so we could get in his shoes and be the white man better than the white man. Oh, you got a, a neutron bomb? Damn, let's drop it. <laughs> Why should we drop it? Let's try it out. There's some niggas over there that I don't like on the west side of Chicago. Drop the bomb on them. You know, I'm like the Gap Band. I'll drop a bomb on them. <laughs> I know this is comical, it's entertaining. I don't mean to be comical, but you, as you laugh, learn. What I'm trying to tell you is God will not give you power, you're too crazy to handle it. This is why I say to my Libyan brothers, we don't put guns in these people's hands. See, in Libya, everybody got a gun. I don't mean a gun. I mean something that shoots more than once. Everybody's armed in Libya. Gaddafi has armed the whole population. Naturally, the babies carry a loaded bottle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brothers and sisters, I guess it's time for me to go. <laughs> but look, I was in Libya. You don't see anybody running out. All right, don't mess with me and firing down on the people. I thought the other day when I was there for their celebration, brother and I were in the Green Square, Revolutionary Square, is that what they call yes, it? Sir. Thousands of people there, nobody drunk. I said, brother, isn't this wonderful to be in a nation where nobody drinks? No drunken drivers on the road. Of course, if they had a little alcohol, mixed with the way they drive. <laughs> but you think about that, nobody drunk. People having a good time, nobody drunk. You don't find the Libyan men going out, winking at, hey baby. This is a fine mama feeling on the girl in Revolutionary Square. Mm -mm. 
Not in that world. They have more respect. They're much further advanced than we are. We can't give you democracy yet. You actually need a mother, a loving dictator that knows your needs better than you know them and then feeds you that you may grow into a sane mind where you can make decisions on your own. Now listen to me carefully. You all with me? I'm going to wrap this up in just a few minutes. Look, beloved, listen. Elijah Muhammad is to black people in America as a mother is to a child. We put you out of the society and out of fear. That's the way babies learn. We were afraid to be put out of what we love, so we threw the cigarette down. We kept hankering for one. We, we, we were looking to see if anybody was looking. I used to throw my packs of cigarette away, then look if anybody was looking, and then run, grab it, and put it back. <laughs> and you know, after doing all of that, I finally got the strength to throw my cigarettes away. It's been 31 years I have not smoked a cigarette. I used to, I used to drink just a little though. I never, that stuff is terrible. I have never liked the feeling of being out of my mind. You know, that, that's a bad feeling, brother and sister. I mean, when you don't have balance, you know what I mean? When you're in that kind of shape and you do it to yourself, you're not qualified to be in a democracy because you have chosen death over life and somebody needs to stop you from killing yourself. Yeah. Elijah Muhammad took the whiskey bottle out of our hand and said, if you drink, I'm throwing you out of the society. We busted the bottles. Now that dope. Now that was something. Because we used to engage in a little hashish and a little marijuana, a little ganja. Coke was out of the question in those days. It was very much in the question today. Can you imagine a dope head people wanting to be free? Free to do what? You grow more dope. Hey, look, we're free. We're a nation. Where does that poppy grow? Let's see if we can grow some in Georgia, in Mississippi, Alabama. You'd be so high, you wouldn't be able to protect your freedom one minute after you got it. Somebody would take it from you. Because you don't need democracy. You need a mother who will nurture you into strength that you may make right decisions for your life. Anytime a man will make a woman pregnant and run out on her and leave it to the state to take care of your responsibility, you don't need a democracy. You need a dictatorship. You need somebody that loves you, that will nurture you, that you may outgrow the need to be governed by fear that you may govern yourself with the intelligence that has been nurtured in you in accord with the nature in which you are created. Are you listening? Yes, sir. Here's a man that will sit down to his table and eat the food. His children are hungry. And they'll get theirs last. Niggardly. Stingy. Non-charitable. Do you hear what I'm saying? You are so much in love with your slave master that if President Reagan tomorrow said, 
that dictator Gaddafi is starting trouble. It's Reagan that got his ships in Libyan waters. Libya has no ships in the Atlantic off America's coast. Did you hear me? It is America sending her planes over the territorial waters of Libya, trying to get a fight with Gaddafi. Why do they want to fight Gaddafi? Because he's dangerous, not because of tanks. He's dangerous because of ideas. He's a good mother. And they don't want Africa to feed from his mind. So they killed Nkrumah or deposed him, got rid of him. They killed Lumumba. They killed uh, Stephen Biko, have Mandela in prison. Every strong black African leader that would be a mother for African sanity has been murdered. Because you are happy people that have no sense of security. It's easy to pluck you. No nation on earth has suffered such a tremendous loss of leadership. You are like a woman that has a menstrual cycle that never stops. Your blood keeps on running in the streets because you don't need a democracy. You need a loving dictatorship. Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I praise God for that little black man. That man taught me. I put the reefer down, the wine down, the whiskey down. He taught me the value of my sperm. You didn't hear me. A man should not waste his sperm, which is the essence of his own life. No wise farmer throws his seeds away. <laughs> Listen, there's some earth out there, oh. And he's around sand at that. A wise farmer, as I see them doing in Libya as a desert, they have a plan now to pump water into the desert to make the desert live. But do you think Brother Gaddafi will go plant seeds before the water makes the earth ready? Black man dropping seeds everywhere. Honorable Elijah Muhammad hated fornication. He hated adultery. He knows what it does to our families and what a free, promiscuous sex life does to a people. It ruins us. Well, how could something like that ruin us? I mean, it is pleasurable. <laughs> I'm not trying to be vulgar. But look, sisters and brothers, what you call pleasure has always brought you pain. You call it pleasure, but it's pain when you give yourself to a man and come to find out the man really didn't think nothing of you. He just wanted pleasure from you and then discarded you like an old piece of toilet tissue 
and went on his merry way, leaving you with a broken heart and probably a baby or two before you got smart. Your pleasure has brought you pain. Children that you don't want and half real. You are potting and boogie looking for another child. Leaving the child you got raising itself with hatred and bitterness in it because it's not being nurtured properly. And then that child brings you to grief. More pain on top of pain because you love pleasure. Silly man. Drunk, doped up, trying to get a woman every day, every night, wasting himself away so that at 20 he looks like he's 35. What's the matter with you? Well, I'm just having a good time. <laughs> no, time is the most precious wealth that we have. And you are destroying time by what you call a good time. You don't need democracy. You need somebody who will first give power to the people that the people may use the power wisely. And the power is in intelligence and in wisdom and in the sharing of knowledge that's in harmony with your nature that will evolve the God nature in you till you become a, an expression of the divine will where you become one self-governing atom tied into the divine law of creation. Not a law imposed on you from the outside, but the very law is the essence of your creation. You don't even know it exists. You just live it. Elijah Muhammad started this. He started this with us. We know that the great and honorable Marcus Garvey gave us an economic base, a political base, but not spiritual. And until you are awakened spiritually, you don't have an awakening. Noble Drew Ali was the first black man among us to bring Islam to black people. History will always record him. Always because he started that process of growth into Islam. He was a good mother. He fed those that would feed from him, but in 1929, he went off to sea. And what they did was attempt to destroy that movement totally and completely, and it dwindled all the way down to nothing. Martin Luther King Jr., they didn't mind you feeding from him till he got dangerous. But any black man that will teach you to love everybody, that's a man that white folk will back up. You didn't hear me. The white man knows he's not an object that should be loved. He knows this. When you tell white people you love them, they know they got a fool on their hand. And the worst thing in the world is for a bunch of sick Muslims to have this Quran in their hand and talk about Muslim love everybody. That's a lie. You can't prove that by this Quran. Allah don't tell us to love everybody. Does Allah say that in this Quran? Allah hates disbelief. And he hates hypocrisy. And he warns Muhammad that if we even 
offer love to our parents who hate belief over, I mean, who love disbelief over belief, we are to reject our own mothers and fathers. And the Bible teaches you the same thing. You can't love everybody, silly people. Oh, I, I love everybody. <laughs> Muhammad loved you. He didn't never say to me he loved white people. In fact, he said he was going to kill all of them. <laughs> I like it myself. Yes, <laughs> Look here. I must say this, when I was in Libya last week talking to the, the conference of the 84 nations, I saw all these Europeans there calling the Africans comrade. I want my brothers to know I was hot as hell. Because you all can forget, but I'll be damned if I will. I never forget. I never forget what the Italians did in Libya, and I hope you don't. I will never forget what the Italians did in Ethiopia, and I hope you don't. I will never forget what the Belgians did in the Congo, and I hope you don't. And I will never forget what those devils are doing in South Africa, and I hope you don't. And, you know, you should be more charitable. After all, they're repenting. The hell you mean they're repenting? The Germans are paying reparations to Israel right now. That's the form that repentance takes. You don't just come up with your mouth. What are the French doing for Algeria? What are the Italians doing for Libya? What are the European powers doing for Africa that they rape and they ravish? Hell no. I know why you don't want Muhammad to live in America. But we're not going to forget nothing. We've got old scores to settle. <laughs> I hear you, but but this generation of whites is much different than the others. They're different. They're, oh no, no, wait just a minute. They're different. Here you are. Look at you. You're trying to be a lawyer for the defense for these little young white ones, right? All right, I'll be the prosecutor. Now look here. They took this whole country from the Indians. I was out in Arizona two weeks ago, up in northern Arizona with the Navajo. The Navajo Indians have the greatest coal reserves on their land, uranium. The Indians are on the land, on the reservation. The government has just said, uh, we, this is ours now. They came right in, put up a sign saying, this is the property of the U.S. government. Now, they gave it to the Indians. And then under that great Georgia saint, Jimmy Carter, J.C.,
He takes the land from the Indians. Listen to me good now. Giving them till 1986 to get off the land. Or they're moving in with the army to force them off the land. Some of these Indians have never lived in the city, like the Bedouins who had never lived in a city. They live in the desert. When you bring them from the desert into the city, you have cultural shock. When you bring the Indians from the reservation and put them in ghetto-like towns, that kills the Indians. I was up among them, beloved. And the tears rolled down my eyes as I went by myself. But I was not alone. They said it was safe. And when I got there, the Indians put security around me. I could not go to the toilet. They didn't have toilets, the outhouse. By myself. This is the truth. They looked after me. I slept out under the stars. And I lived with them for about 30 some hours. And I watched the evil of the United States government at work. But of course, they will tell you they're different from their fathers who killed off all the buffalo, sold the Indians disease blankets, and destroyed them and decimated their ranks and leaves them only a sign of what they formerly were. But now the children want to finish off the Indians. How are they better? Come on! It's the same devil. He has not changed. You just need to press him a little bit and he'll take off the mask of civility and he'll show you a naked beast. Don't you be fooled by a smile and a pat on the back and a white woman in your arms, brother. You ought to reject her. If she come around you, you ought to tell her, uh uh, we caught too much hair from your people for me to walk down the street with a blue eyed girl. Even if you mean good, I don't give a damn. You go with your own people. Down in Miami the other day, a white woman who believes in the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to me, Assalamu alaikum, brother. I said, Wa alaikum salam, sister. <laughs> you can't allow me to sleep with no greetings. I can't forget. Even if you mean well, I gotta sleep with both eyes open. And don't worry, you won't be sleeping nowhere nearby. Did you hear me? You are foolish to trust that which destroyed you, your parents, your grandparents, and is threatening to destroy your unborn generation. You would be a fool to trust that. I saw them at the conference acting like they changed, calling us comrades. I said in my heart, I said, it's a little too late. Europe got to pay for what she did in Africa. And God says, according to both the Bible and the Holy Quran, he would bring to bear on this generation the blood of the righteous from Abel to Zacharias. That means that this generation is sentenced to death 
for what their fathers have done because this generation is not repenting. All white people will do for you today is smile at you and tell you they're sorry. Uh-uh, God don't want that. You really sorry? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> then give the country back. Oh, what? Now, just a minute. There's a limit to being sorry, you know. See? Well, then do justice by the Indians. Leave them alone. If they want you to mine the coal out, give them the same kind of arrangement that you give Saudi Arabia. You help them to get their oil out of the ground, but they get the wealth. Give the wealth to the Indians and let the Indians develop. But you're trying to rob them again. Why? Because you've changed? No. You're the same devil. And right now, beloved, they hook these little young brothers up because they won't give you a job. Hook you right up in the army. And tomorrow, they'll send you to Nicaragua. Tomorrow, they'll send you to Libya. Tomorrow, they'll send you somewhere else in the world where you'll be fighting your own people for your worst enemy. So when they said to Farrakhan that Brother Gaddafi was a dictator and a terrorist, I said, I don't see him the way you see him. They hate that. How dare you see different from me? No, I see him as a friend. I said, the United States government is the worst enemy that black people have ever had and we refuse to let you tell us who our friends should be. You, in my conclusion, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad nurtured us. When he departed from among us, they thought the nation was gone. But what he left in us, we started feeding on it again and started growing from within. And now we are offering that food to you. You must change your life. You must change your lifestyle. You must change the way you eat. You must change the way you think. You must be taught how to go to toilet. That's a heavy thing. We don't even know how to do that well. Do you believe that? We must be taught how to bathe, to be clean. We must be taught how to wear clothes not clothes for style alone, clothes to cover your shame. You must be taught not to expose your nudist parts in the public. You must be taught not to walk around in tight, tight, tight pants, brother that people can measure you from sight. You must be taught how to be clean in moral conduct and loving and kind to one another. You must be taught how to love yourself and one another. When you are taught those basic things and you show that you are mastering those basic things, then the higher feeding begins. We give you milk, then meat. Not the physical meat of the flesh of an animal, but the meat of the Word of God. Then as you begin to chew the substance of the wisdom of God, you grow intellectually. 
This scripture says, be ye of one mind. The same mind that is in Christ Jesus, let it be where? In you. I say to my brothers from Libya, until the mind of Gaddafi is in the children, the revolution is not safe. You hear me? The children must have the idea they'll be better at it than we. So we cannot build a new people unless we get control of that which forms their mind. The education. We got to take it over or take them out. We cannot let our enemy teach our children. He will ruin them as he ruined most of us. You agree? We must have an education that makes us unite. This is why when my Hebrew Israelite brothers came in, I don't see someone different. I see myself. I see my flesh, my blood, my brother. When my Elrican brothers came in, I didn't see something strange. I saw my flesh, my blood, my brother. That the world hates because they're organized and they're disciplined. Suppose all of us organize. Suppose we refuse to bow down to the labels that divide us like Christian or Muslim and Elrukan and Hebrew Israelite and see that these are names but the principle. The principle upon which all of us are constructed comes from the one God and all of us got it by nature. You can destroy the Bible and burn the Quran, but if man's nature is intact, the word of God will live again. Because the word of God is revealed from the nature of God, which is the nature of man. You got it? Yes, sir. We need to evolve. We've got to come away from ritual. Prayer, listen, prayer can't be just this anymore. Prayer has to teach us something. When the Muslim says, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, this is a sign of surrender and one who has heard the call and answers it in surrender to God. He says, Allah is the greatest, meaning I have no more fight with the God. I submit. I surrender. I have heard your call. I bear witness you are the greatest. Isn't that beautiful? But unless you're in tune with the meaning, then we just do this. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. What does it mean? It means God is the greatest. Well, if you bear witness that God is the greatest, let it show forth in your life that when America asks you to bow, say, I bow only to God. You understand? When the man bring his guns and say, bow, say, I bow only to God. Eat the gun. And we have whipped them with guns. We don't carry no weapon, but we'll take your weapon from you and beat your brains out with it and blow your brains out with it. No. The weapon is not God. Allah is God. Don't put a weapon in a man's hand make him think he's a man. God makes men, not weapons. That's why you punk out when you lose it. But somebody took my weapon. That's why when we search you and take your little knife, you come in here, you don't know what to do with yourself. Scared to death, because you're not a man without your weapon. 
The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the weapon must be the extension of the man. Not the man, the extension of the weapon. So you must make him a man first. Then you must teach him who his enemy is before you put the weapon in his hand. Lest that fool arm will kill himself. We got a different problem over here. We got a savage to civilize. Allah Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. What do you say? I bear witness that Muhammad is the door through which I found my nature and my oneness with God. So in Muhammad, I have my example. And Muhammad stood against opponents. He stood against tyranny and oppression. I too must stand. Jesus stood. I too must stand. Moses stood, I too must stand. None of them had no little mamby pamby uh, Quaker Oats religion. Religion that gives you strength. Religion that makes your life meaningful, not make you a slave. I'm not a slave to Islam. Islam is not a coat that I put on in the morning when I go out, come home and take it off and lay it in the closet. It is my nature. I lie down with it. I get up with it. I walk with it. I eat with it. I talk with it. I live with it. And that's why the white man can't do nothing to fire cars because I'm in harmony with the nature of God. I have been crystallized into oneness with God through the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So the more they attack me, the more they are divided, not we. Because the power of God is with his saints and his servants. So the Muslim holds his hands, his right hand over the left at the midsection. He drops his head and he says, I seek refuge in Allah from the accursed Satan. You're not talking about a spirit. You're talking about a people that have gone so far off the path that they are cursed and driven from the face of God. You don't want to be like the American people. They are hypocrites. You don't want to follow them. You don't want their path. You want the path of Almighty God, Allah, the path of peace, the path of righteousness. So you grip your left hand with your right at the wrist. And whenever you're in judo, when you grab a man, stand up, brother, and you grab him at that wrist, you can move him because you got him in a control point. The point is that when you put your right hand over your left, where you got the left hand under control at the navel, it's a sign of something. All Muslims do good things with the right hand. Unclean things they do with the left hand because the left represents the weaker side of the nature of the human being. So unless the weaker side of man is in the grip of the stronger side of man, then the man may go to hell. Do you hear me? Yes, unless the woman is under the control of a rightly guided man, the nation goes to hell. Unless the lower passions of a man and a woman are in control of their rightly guided intellect, that man or that woman is on their way to hell. And the thing that sends you to hell is never your brain, it is your appetites. You understand? Appetite, what do you want? That's how the white man rule you. What do you want? Baby, I got it. That's what the white man said. What do you want? You want fame? Come here, Vanessa. You want to be a big shot? Come on. What's that boy with the dark glasses and the glove? 
Michael! Come on, Michael! All your stars are ruined! Prince! Princess! Look at you! Uh, where you going? I'm going to see Prince. Spending your money to see a man act like a woman. Spending your money to see a man dressed up in a diaper. You crazy! You don't need democracy. You need a teacher that will grip you and make you right until you are desirous of being right on your own. Heck with what the world said. It's a dictatorship. God don't have no democracy. He dictates. He's going to ask you nothing. He tells you. Then, as you begin to pray, the Muslim then, in this manner, What does the bending mean? Some Muslims used to tell us, y'all don't pray like the Muslims pray. They said, you all are not true Muslims because you only stand up and pray like this. You don't go through the real prayer service. I said, what would you say if you met Abraham and he just spread his hands forth like this. What would you say if you met Solomon and he just spread his hands forth like this? Don't you realize this is a nation evolving through all of the steps? Bending your back means nothing. This back, which carries what? The vertebrae and what? The spinal cord. It's what separates you from the lower animals. You can stand up and walk upright. And this back, in order for you to bend it, for somebody to bend your back, they have to have strength to overpower you. Is that right? Yes, sir. And your resistance and they're working to overpower you, they break your back. And when they break your back, they kill you. Is that right? Yes, sir. Bending your back means Bowing your will before the majesty and the overpowering wisdom of God. Where your spinal cord and your nerves all react to the will of God. You're bending, you're bowing. If you bow your back in a ceremony, that's all it is, ceremony. Man bows his back, gets up, smokes a reef. Bending your back means bow the strength of yourself to the wisdom and the will of God. Then the Muslim prostrates. You ever see the Muslims prostrate? You know how the Muslim is down in this kind of position? And you see him with his feet together and hands in front of him and his forehead on the ground? He ain't worshiping no strange God. From the beginning, the servants of God bowed their heads down low before Almighty God. Do you know what this is? You return into the womb. That's the way you look when you came out of your mother's womb, all curled up like a little knot. What you're saying, as God, the Creator, evolved you from sperm, brought you from a clot to an embryo than a fetus and brought you out and nurtured you up to be this big shot man and woman that you are. When you recognize the greatness of God, you can't stand up in front of him. You want to bow and then that becomes too proud. Then you want to return to the position that you were in when he brought you forth out of your mother's womb. All it is is a physical exercise that is spiritually to train you to be humble, oh so humble to the will and the wisdom 
of God, but just doing it without the spiritual recognition of what you're doing means it becomes a frivolous exercise and you quickly go into it, do your steps, prostrate, get up, and the, and the fool is looking on the outside saying, now that's a good Muslim, he's saying his prayers. But you're not saying your prayers until you say them from the heart and mean the words and your actions are in accord with the positions that you take. All the times of prayer have meaning. What are you saying, Farrakhan, in conclusion? I'm saying that we do not need Hajj anymore. We don't need to go to Mecca and make a pilgrimage to a stone and say, here I am in the presence of Allah. We need to take the real pilgrimage, which is to go right up into the glory of God. And that real pilgrim is to sacrifice your life. You remember in the last days of the pilgrimage, you killed the animals? Killing the animals means you must kill the passions, the animal passions of your human existence in order to evolve into God. It's easy to walk to Mecca and kill that animal, but it's difficult to kill the beast of your own lower nature. We must make the real pilgrimage to God. We don't want to drink blood and eat wafers and talk about, I'm drinking the blood of Jesus. I'm not Dracula. And I don't want Jesus' blood. But as blood is the life fluid of the individual, I want the life of Jesus. That's what you're saying. I want to live his life. That's what you mean when you drink his blood, you become one with his life. Now that you know what that means, become one with his life through the word and leave the wine alone. You understand what I'm saying? Prayer without meaning is of no value. People don't want ritual. They want the substance, the meaning. All right? Let's evolve higher. Let's not be slaves to religion. And so, beloved, I would hope that we who recognize that our people hunger to be free, we must fight for their liberation with every ounce of our strength. I appeal to you all, help to deliver our people up yes, from this cruel bondage of sin and ignorance. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, please, fight to get control of your nature, yourself, and then be yourself. And what is yourself? A righteous servant of Almighty God. You think you've got the strength yes, to put the cigarette aside? Yes, sir. It's killing you. What a little white cigarette. Your master. I just can't stop. I can't stop. Big old man and big woman mastered by three inch cigarette. Or some more white powder that they call Coke. Things go better with Allah. Can you give it up? Can you give it up? You gotta stop eating this nasty, filthy swine. I know, I know, I know. You like it. The pork is a nasty animal. Oh, have you ever looked at one recently? You ought to just take a look in the face of a hog. And after you look in the face of a hog, if you can eat it after that, you deserve it. And it deserves it. That's an ugly creature. I don't know how y'all can eat shrimp. 
nasty scavenger of the sea. Right. It's a nasty, poisonous little old thing. Right. Oh, but it's so sweet. And look at you. A poisoned human being. Swelling up. Old. Tired. And you're a young woman and a young man. Look at Brother Farrakhan. And my wife is here. Nine to seven. Yeah. children, 14 grandchildren, how to eat to live. Don't kill yourself with the way you eat. In fact, when we leave here, we want to invite all of you to dinner. Yes, sir. I, I mean, I, I don't want you to think that we pay for it now. <laughs> I would like to be able to do that, but I tell you the truth. <laughs> we can't afford it. But we're going to be at the Beverly House, and we want you all to come over. What does the dinner cost? Seven fifty for. Look now, it's at least three courses. You get soup. Salad, the main dish, then your dessert, and a juice. All you can eat. All you can eat five piece band. We're just going to relax and enjoy our second anniversary. But you can see, it's a beautiful building, isn't it? But we've outgrown it. I mean, it's nice. But it just can't hold the people. What does that mean? What you gonna do with this? You know, this is gonna be our television studio. We're gonna make the basement a total tape and printing department where we will print the literature and teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and spread it, make the tapes, and up here, we'll make the uh, video, and there will be the offices that will count the money. Yes, sir. Yes. But I think we've outgrown this. We need a building that has a school attached to it. Yes, sir. If it doesn't have a school attached to it, we ought to go on and ask the city, since they're closing schools down. Let us have one, and we'll open a school up. How many of you in here are school teachers? Would you raise your hands? Look at this. In the balcony, any? We need to begin our own school. Help us to do that. I thank you so much. I sure enjoyed your company. Don't leave, though. Where's Brother Akbar Muhammad? He thought I was going to go on for another year. So he went to Florida to give him some sunshine. He figured he'd be back by the time I finished. Got a tan, huh, brother? <laughs> I want to say to the Muslims, uh, to the laborers, the great workers, thank you so much for honoring us with your presence. We've had a wonderful weekend. Yes, sir. Beautiful. We are so fired up to go on with the great work 
of freeing our people till I believe the next five months will show or manifest the greatest progress that Islam has made in America in the last 55 years. Yes, sir. We intend to do it in five months. Yes, we know we can. Yes, and the Muslim brothers and sisters that came for the conference have assured me that we will. That's right. That's right. That's right.